Welcome back to The Breakfast and Plus TV Africa. Time for Off the Press. And as usual, we will take you through the pages of our dailies. And we have G.D. Johnson, who is live in the studio uh, with us this morning. He'll be making sense of all of the uh, top stories on our papers. It's good to have you join us this morning, G.D. Johnson. Good morning. It's a pleasure to be with you, Messi and Osalgui. <laughs> and um, Happy New Year in advance to our viewers all over the world. All right, then uh, let's start off uh, the papers this morning with the leadership uh, newspaper. And of course, the focus would be on the major stories on the leadership newspaper. Now, the banner caption on the leadership newspaper reads, Momentous event that shaped the year 2021. Many sides of a difficult, eventful year. That's what you have. Underneath the caption, Nigerian stake stock. Still looking at the papers, federal government's cause President Mohamed Buhari high on economy and security in 2021. Be ruthless with terrorists, bandits, COAS, others, generals. And foremost medical doctor Dante Ahmed dies at 83. You also have another caption here saying, CSO's alleged fresh plot against Electoral Act Amendment Bill. And this is some of the headlines on the leadership newspaper. And also the Daily Independent. Big story there says forensic audit. Buhari vows to recover every cobble stolen from NDDC. Says culprits will face the law. Also, AUGF indicts National Assembly Management Commission in 9.4 billion naira unexplained expenses. Queries reps over 5.52 billion naira on accounted expenditure. Gunmen kill police officer abduct one in Anambra. And also, federal government lists, uh, lists 100 achievements of Buhari's government in 2021. Says president will leave legacy of safe, prosperous Nigeria. Senate launches investigation into award of 7.5 billion naira contract in NPA. We can also find on the Daily Independent, uh, Ikpazu meets Buhari, insists Indigo deserve presidency in 2023. And um, I oppose insecurity, not Buhari's administration, says Bishop Kuka. All right, let's uh, move away from the Daily Independent and check out the Punch newspaper this morning. And the board caption says, APC National Convention, uncertainty over February date as peace panel flops. Uh, very, very interesting Ruling party fears outcome of pending court cases may nullify convention. Adamu's panel can't conclude reconciliation before convention. That's what the chief Tain is quoted to say. And you also say, have um, the caption here, CBN Forex policies may threaten economic growth in 2022. That's according to reports. And six multinationals to pay 249 billion oil proceeds in January, according to the NNPC. Buhari vows to recover NDDC funds from looters and justifies audit. Panel summons clerk as AG says the National Assembly's 9.4 billion naira unaccounted for. And uh, still looking at the pages, or I mean the front page of the Punch newspaper, you also have. Um, CNS vows clam down on maritime troops colliding with criminals. And EU seizes 82% of Nigeria's agro products exported illegally. That's what the federal government is quoted to say. A Korean monarch intervenes in all knees marital rift. You also have another caption here. Mackinday's loyalists kicked as APC carpets governor over insecurity and infrastructure. Uh, just before we move away, Igbo more knowledgeable and should be president in 2023. And that's Ikpazu quoted on all of that. But that's the much we can take this morning on the Punch newspaper. And finally to the Guardian newspapers. Uh, four years on, Nigeria lags behind in open skies. $1.3 billion revenue agenda. Federal government operators divided on implementation strategy and prospects. We can also find here military combs like Chad kills 22 terrorists, uh, loses six troops. Audit reports indicts National Assembly over 9 billion naira unexplained expenditure. Boko Haram destroys 1 million public and private buildings in Borno. 
on why Igbo should be president in 2023. And that's uh, from um, Ipazu once again. Doubts over federal government's capacity to remove federal subsidy as election nears. And with that, we'll say good morning to Jide Johnson. Thank you for joining us. Uh, pretty interesting stories that we can find across the papers. Um, I'm not sure which would be a nice place to start. Maybe the federal government's uh, 100 achievements in 2021. Uh, I, I, I think the, that's in the scorecard of the federal government. And it's, 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 it's very interesting in the sense that the federal government is calling the federal government, it's calling the presidency. Mm -hmm. You set the exam for yourself and you're examining yourself. I believe that it should be the citizen that should examine and them. Um, I watched the press conference and um, of all, across all media reportage of that event, I didn't see anywhere the minister was asked questions. I think the minister, the, it, sh it shouldn't just be a session whereby the um, minister would just make his presentation without taking tough questions. As far as I'm concerned, if you look at the two top most item identified by the minister that is called the government high on the economy and on the security, mm -hmm. the reflections, the inflation on ground and the insecurity across the length and breadth of Nigeria is an indication that the government did not score anything high based on what the minister said. Because in one of the stories that we read, it said Boko Haram destroyed one million houses in Borno. That's one of the stories that we read. And we see the speed of the economy across, across board. Uh, what has been um, the cost of living, the standard of living of an average of an average Nigerian, let's use this yellow type period as, as an index of, of measuring whether government has really done well when it comes to the economy or whether government has not really done well. You quite know, you and I know people that asked us for a lifeline. You know how many people, because they see you on screen and they think you have all the money in the world. And today that I'm even dressing like a senator, I've even, <laughs> I've even created problem for myself. So essentially, as far as I'm concerned, if you look at the scorecard, is federal government setting the exam? and the federal government examining itself. It should be with the Nigerian people. I think what the minister should have done is to have commissioned an organization to do a public opinion polling to see how Nigerians have scored this, this government, whether it has really done well. In the US, they do, they do these ratings every now and then, you know. Yeah, say, yeah you know, that's, that's what I'm saying. It's not, it's, not, it's, not, yeah. it's, not, it's, not, it's not there for the minister of information to tell us that the government has done well. It's, it's for us here to do a survey public opinion polling to see how what is the public approval and rating of President Mahmoud Bari? What is the public approval and rating of his economic policy? It's you know, like you said, every month on monthly basis, on quarterly basis, different types of organization release their polls to show uh, the performance of government. But if you give it to if you ask me to assess myself as Aruge, how do you think I'll assess myself? Fantastic. I say I've done well. Yeah. And that's what um, the, the federal government has done. The federal government has engaged in self-assessment and it's an exercise in self-delusion. And as far as Nigerians are concerned, the reality on ground does not match up with, the, with what the minister said with respect to um, the scorecard, 100 achievement, security, and the rest of it. When even the, there's this particular story where the chief of army staff directed um, the military to go after to go after to go after bandits i'm not too sure we have really done well when it comes to that two items that they list as number one and number two on their scorecard i don't think so and I, i'm sure a lot of nigerians will agree with me that um, things are not okay when it comes to the economy and things are not okay when it comes to security Okay, um, um, uh, just uh, on the leadership newspaper, uh, it says events that actually shaped, shaped uh, 2021. And you also have like uh, pictures to actually tell some of the story. I mean, the death of TB Joshua, uh, you know, Namdi Kanu's case, what have you, several issues. But for you, uh, what would you say that is that major event that happened in Nigeria that shaped 2021? I'm not even looking at what shape 2022. I was going to shape 2022. What's going to shape 2023, um, which is the electra, the non-passage of the electra bill that was sent to the president for his assent. As far as I'm concerned, politics shapes everything. 
It is the politics that determines the polity. The polity determines the policies. And it is the policy that shapes people's life. Now, you recall in 2019, we provided an excuse that, okay, well, you know what? It was, too, it was so close, so the president cannot sign the Electoral Act of 2019 into an act. And then we provided that excuse. And it's like history repeats itself syndrome. And now, we are going to 2023 election. Some of the challenges we have with 2019 election have not been addressed. But some of the issues discovered have been addressed by the Electoral the, by the electoral bill that has been forwarded to the president. That has not been passed. Now, if you relate that to a story of the, of the APC convention where the peace panel has failed to create to, that there's every likelihood that the convention will be, will be shifted in February because a lot of litigation is going on concerning the APC primaries across APC conventions across the states at the state level, at the local government level. So as far as I'm concerned, it's what has shaped 2023 is non-signage of that act, of that bill into an act that will guide the conduct of 2023 elections. And that's moving forward because without politics, you can't. Politics affect the economy. Politics affect technology. Politics affect every aspect, every aspect, every aspect of our lives. And it's like we are going back. We are going to use the 2010 Electoral Act. That means how many years? We are 13 years. Behind, behind schedule. We failed to do the needful in 2014 to 2015. We failed to do the needful in 2019. Now, we're having these challenges in 2023, and people are providing the excuse. And we have argued that, you know what, if the contentious area is the direct primaries or indirect primaries, expunge that particular section or that particular call clause and send it back to the National Assembly and sign it into law, except we don't want to have a framework that will guide the 2020 election. Because if there is no governance, there won't be policy. And if there is no policy, there won't be, there won't be any it's meaningful expected development. that the National Assembly might do that when they uh, resume planning? You know, for me, I think that both the National Assembly and the presidency are playing politics with us. That's the reality. You recall that it took the intervention of well-meaning Nigerians and all Nigerians, both civil, organized labor parties and the rest of us, technocrats, politicians, business, to clamor for the National Assembly to include the electronic voting. You know it was jettisoned in the first instance, to include the electronic voting. Now, we pressure the National Assembly to include that. Now, the National Assembly went ahead and insert direct primaries into the bill, into the bill knowing quite all right that critical stakeholders in their party, that's the governor and the presidency and even the party structure itself were not in favor of that um, mood of primaries for their party and they went ahead to do it. So as far as I'm concerned, I think there's a conspiracy among the political class to truncate the 2023 election well okay. i totally understand uh, uh the fact that uh, you're very concerned about 2022 and the events that will actually shape it of course 2023 but i also like you to share your thoughts uh, on this paper you have different events that they put out uh, for them but what event do you think that happened what what really happened in 2021 that you think you know took a toll on the country <sighs> there are so many events um that happened then in 2021. I think that for me, it's, um, it's the issue of Oji Uzokalu that was freed by the court, that was thrown away. And then you, you have a story in the newspaper where the president is saying that he's vying to recover all the money stolen from NDC. Okay, and we have a case that was tried over a period of 12 years, and the case was thrown off by, you had a conviction given by by, by lower courts and then the Supreme Court threw away that case. As far as I'm concerned, it shows that we are not really fighting corruption because if indeed we are fighting corruption, we should make examples of those that have dipped their hand into the covers of public funds. Besides that, what measures have we put in place to prevent people from stealing? Are you getting yeah. my point? Now, if um, there was a story last week that we read where um, the NDC deputy director they recover 60 building. You, remember, you call last before, 60 building was recovered. That's just one deputy director. What about all the directors? So as far as I'm concerned, um, is, the, is, the, is the lip service 
that we are paying to fighting corruption. Because if you actually deal with corruption in this country, if we manage it, I'm sure Nigeria, Dubai will not compete with Nigeria. Well, we're going to get back to this, you know, because there's also another story on the Daily Independent talking about the Attorney General of the Federation accusing the National Assembly of the Auditor nine, General of the Federation. Auditor General, I beg your pardon, um, indicting National Assembly Management Commission in 9.4 billion naira unexplained expenses. We'll get back to that, but we need to give you quick updates on um, 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 accidents, you know, that uh, occurred on the Lagos Ibadan Expressway, multiple car accidents uh, that uh, occurred uh, late uh, early this morning. The first involves an articulated vehicle with an unknown registration loaded with diesel, which has currently been cordoned off for a transloading of products. And the second multiple vehicle accident involves an articulated vehicle once again loaded with PMS with registration number unknown and four other vehicles, a black Toyota Corolla um, with a registration number APP681FL, a, ye a yellow commercial uh, bus, a gray Honda Accord with uh, registration number AKD368GP and a gray Toyota Sienna which were all involved in this accident. Further information gathered revealed that a tanker lost control due to a mechanical fault, uh, brake failure as it is uh, stated, um, hit the Honda Accord from the rear before, of course, falling into, onto the Toyota Corolla. Seven casualties received on the spot treatment from the pre-hospital care unit, while four others were taken to the trauma center. No fatality has been recorded so far. And of course, uh, the um, Lagos Fire Service and um, uh, others are present at the scene. We'll, of course, give you further updates um, on this as uh, the time passes on the program this morning. Once again, it's um, reports on the multiple accidents on Otedola Bridge on the Lagos Ibadan Expressway. You know, I was, I was coming this morning. I would miss that. I, I, I saw the traffic build up because I left them around 5 15 a.m. and I was trying to navigate through that axis and Google map to into another route and then I came I bust out at Alausa and I saw um, the question we need to ask is that to the dollar bridge that particular section we've seen it's a recurrent feature yes. of um, articulated vehicles carrying diesel carrying PMS tumbling and I've, it's a problem of design and if government want to really solve this problem and not to waste the life of Niger, all we need to do is to redesign that, that section. You see, if you are coming from Bega, you descend and then you ascend almost simultaneously on either, either side of that section. And you ask yourself this basic question. Who was the engineer that was involved in the design of that particular... Because we are not ready to spend money at that time because it should be elevated. The bridge should be elevated... To, 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 to this point, as you are coming, you don't need to descend. And we need to correct that once and for all. In order not for us not to lose that. Every time I go to, I, I keep asking myself, do we have engineers in Nigeria working in Ministry of Works in the state and at the federal level? It's, it's just a basic problem of design. And in research, we tell you, if your design is, if your design is wrong, your hardcore will be wrong. Because what determines your, 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 the evidence you gather is the design. Is the design. So the design of that particular is wrong. And if we don't correct it once and for all, we have lost. If anyone leaves home, say 4 a.m., and I'm sure many people will have left home around that time to travel outside of Lagos, you'll be shocked to see the traffic that built up. I left home 5 15 a.m. this morning. And I saw I was shocked. And it's that same, that same place that we lost many lives, and it is that same Very spot. Close, and yes. government has refused. To do something, you just don't. You just need, just drive through it, and you know that it's a problem of design. Simple as A B C. Now something is building up towards at the base of Todd Mayland Bridge. Mm. You know they've recovered those land. It's just a matter of time. Is the design when Todd Mayland Bridge was designed, the recovered land as you are approaching over Shoki was not recovered it was it was higher now you need to see that place it's it's now higher than than the base of the third Milan bridge so it's just a matter of that we pray to heaven for god to come and solve the problem when it's just a basic problem of design people should follow design permit me to use this when god told moses to build the temple he said build the temple according to the pattern I've shown to you. So it's a problem of design. So we keep losing lives and we keep blaming God or they'll be blaming the devil. Now nothing will come out. There's nothing yeah, that, that will come that, out. That, that, that that maybe I, is the, I passed the through Jura this part. morning. Nothing will come out. The building that collapsed 
What has happened to it? Azarge, yes, we continue with our life. Well, let's also, you, you started with, you know, talking about the fight against corruption. So let's talk about the Auditor General's office, you know, that is indicting National Assembly in a 9.4 billion naira unexplained expenses. Can, this the is senators, all over the can the senators steal money without the clerk? Can they take money without the Auditor General of the National Assembly? The people that are in charge to maintain due diligence, they should be arrested and prosecuted. I've said it. Yeah, but we, in never, the fact, we never get it, to see any of yeah, this Exactly. I mean, he, 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 the, have you ever seen any Auditor General being indicted in Nigeria? Have you ever seen any Director of Finance being indicted in Nigeria? Now, until you put measures in place to deal with, and that's the question we ask, what are the measures that have been put in place to fight corruption? Beyond the rhetorics on the pages of newspaper, I will recover a vow. I will recover, direct, instruct, Same thing with arrest. the NDDC story. Same thing with the NDDC story. So we don't have a structure. And yet, we have the Due Process Act that talks about our funds. The question I keep asking myself, how is it easy for people to take fund out of public, public pause without people raising flags? Without what EFCC will go about is to arrest boys on the street probably they had a tattoo on their body or they had something, they had dreadlocks and the rest of it. Now, they were, they, were, they were designed to deal with economic and financial crimes in government. Now, these agencies of government, what are they doing beyond prosecution? Yeah. There should be intelligence gathering. We should have, ERCC should have a unit that prevents this from happening. Not until we get to prosecution, they will now parade these people, we have media trial, and they they, they, they manage the perception, they manipulate public opinion, and they let us feel that, oh, we are fighting corruption. This person has been arrested. He has been taken to court. All we have is media trial. And I've said it. Where do we have records of funds that were recovered in the last six years? You know, they used to say, we recovered this between. Where is the record? Was the record released, I've asked, by the Auditor General of the Federation? Was it gazetted by... The Attorney General of the Federation. We just see it on the page of newspaper, and we too will run to town with the stories that the federal government recovered 60 buildings. Those buildings that they said they recovered last week, where are the buildings? What are the numbers of the buildings? Where are those houses? Now, those houses, what are we going to do with it? Now, if we recover those houses, are we selling it off and returning back the money to government? Or are we converting it, converting it to, to, to public housing, whereby you partition the house and you, you ask people to apply and then they, they use it? So until we begin to recover those property and convert those property to public use, until we begin to recover funds and convert those funds to public use, we are, we are not making any headway. How can 9.4 billion get missing from the National Assembly? without any flag being raised, without any agencies of the government. You know, this money went through yes. banks. Yes. And EFCC had access to it. Went through bank, went through the banking system. All right, let, let's also know. take a look at, uh, you know, the leadership newspaper. On this one, it talks about um, be ruthless with terrorists, bandits, COAS orders generals. And uh, we're still talking about the issue of insecurity. Does, does it need the direction of and, uh, the chief of the army staff? That, uh, you know, in 2023, the government is saying we're going to, you know, get all of this element out of the system. What's the essence of the army and the military? Is to protect, defend the territorial integrity of Nigeria. And we have seen a situation whereby we read the story of Boko Haram destroying one million houses in Borno. We have stories of banditry in Zamfara State. There was a major news yesterday that a 20-year-old was arrested in Zamfara, a notorious bandit was arrested in Zamfara. Um, we had cases of ISWAP making any road and collecting taxes in the Niger Republic. We had cases of banditry in, in, in Kasina State, the home state of the president. So it doesn't need um, a major call or clarion call or directive or order for the chief of army staff that they should fight banditry. That's the role of the military. The military okay, should protect... But, but let's also look at another thing as well. Uh, the constant involvement of the military in, you know, civil affairs, in internal security um, the, issues in the country, that has called for a lot of concern. And some persons have constantly said that that reduces the professionalism of the military. As the military was created, like you have rightly mentioned, you know, to protect uh, the country from external aggression and attacks. When you have that in the United States, you know what they are called? They are called National Guard. Yes. The moment they got involved 
in Internal, civil, yeah, civil they become National Guard. They have a different orientation, different perspective, different uniform. You know, once there is hurricane or this natural disaster, you see the, the American military comes in, but they are called National Guard. Now, do we, do we, do we, do we have, have they been trained that when you are operating as a National Guard, this is the code of conduct? And when you are operating as the military, this is the code of conduct. Haven't you had an encounter with these people? Haven't you seen, even seen ordinary people wearing camouflage? I have said it, Osar Organ Messi. We are still in a civilian administration. We are not in a democracy. In democracy, military authority subjects themselves to civilian control. That's one of the basic requirements of democratic society. That military authority subject themselves to civilian control. So the, the, the Nigerian military, have they been trained and equipped to deal with civil matters? That's, that's it. And then if you are bringing them in, we need to change their uniform for them to have a different perspective. And then you need to orientate them through training for them to understand that because the military is trained to see you as an enemy. That is to fight the enemy. Anything in front of the military is to be crushed. Yes or no? So, but if you are bringing them to deal with an internal affairs, you must understand that they must be given a different orientation and they must be given a different uniform and they must be given a different name. Well, I mean, that, that would not, be in a society because we, we need to go. That would be in a society that values, you know, those civil, those rights, you know, of, of the Nigerian society and, that values and the value of life. Human of life. That's, exactly. that's the basic thing. Um, is the, yeah. is the value that we place, the premium we place on life. Absolutely. And that's, and that's the premium. What's the worth of a life? That's the premium, and that's what Maybe that bridge. When, when there is a society that values those things, values the rights and the life of a Nigerian, then that training will be set aside for military um, officers that will be involved in civil. You, you know, know what? What gives you that right, Osaroge? Is life. Well, a dead man does not have a right. Absolutely. It's that life. Every right is entrenched in life. All right, now, if we value that life, then our society will be a different, a yeah. different ballgame. We won't have that accident. We have on Otedola Bridge, a recurrent one that we keep having over and over and over again. All right, we'll take a short break and uh, share with you what happened on this day in history. And uh, right after that, we get into our first major conversation for today. And we're talking about you, the citizen, and the role that you have to play in governance and in nation building. That's what comes up next. Stay with us. Um, I, I'm size Casey, please. Can I